G'day, how are you going? Welcome to Multinational Operations. During this block we're going to explore the full range of capabilities available to the Joint Force Commander. These capabilities come from within the US military and other agencies, but we know both in terms of strategic documents and also in understanding the future operating space that we need to operate as an international force as part of multinational operations. To assist us in conducting multinational operations, both in terms of planning and execution, the joint publications outline the tenets and considerations. These are important in allowing us to bring forces from different nations together and ensuring that we can combine into single purpose and meet our national interests. This doctrine has been developed over years of hard learned lessons. When I was asked to give you this kind of remote lecture, uh, I thought about this problem and, and this question about uh, multinationality, asking myself what's new there. Because if you go through the past and through the wars for centuries and centuries, multinationality has been a fact in almost all wars. You can find, I think, a limited number of examples where one only nation was involved in a war. It might be the case of France in Algerian war, for instance, or in kind of counter some inter uh, counterintelligence. Oh, sorry for that. This, this is multinationality as well. Uh, when you, you work in a foreign language, uh, some counterinsurgency examples. Apart from that, uh, I seldom find examples of one only nation being at war. Multinationality is a fact. I think it's fair to start tackling the problem, asking ourselves, what does that mean for me operationally? What does that mean in terms of getting prepared to it? And I think that what is new in our century and what has been new after World War II is that we've gone through the system of alliance, structured alliance, to have multinationality organized. That's the case of NATO, for instance, that has been for 50 years bringing allies around the table to making sure that interoperability was ensured around common goals. And this is a very good example of what I call structured multinationality. However, you can find there and there, that's the case uh, against ISIL in Iraq for a time being, for instance, ad hoc alliance, which benefits from the structured multinationality, but which is built upon an ad hoc basis. And I think this is the really new thing of our century uh, compared to the past years, is really this structured, and NATO is an example of how we can frame and organize multinationality. NATO and the ad hoc coalitions also leads me to think about what are the different impact of multinationality to the different levels we talk about, strategic level, operational level, or tactical level. Strategic level as strategic planners have as an absolute must to gather the largest possible coalition. When operators, a joint force level, have all the difficulties to, to make this ad hoc coalition work, and I think sometimes for efficiency matters, operational level commanders would like to have smaller coalitions with less multinationality but more efficiency. That's where you can see sometimes the strategic and operational level goals and aims being uh, pulling in different, di different directions. When it comes to tactical level though, uh, usually all the obstacles of multinationality have been leveled by the operational level, and that's where you can see some efficiency. Uh, comes to my mind uh, a very an example I, I experienced in Kosovo, it was in 2000, yeah, 2000, the year 2000. Uh, and where the multinationality and the differences in laws, rules of engagement was beneficial to the entire operation. There was a huge, huge cross, crowd mast on the southern bank of Ibar of uh, Albanian Kosovo who wanted to go in the Serbian side. And then the few units that were on the bridge were under high pressure from the crowd. So we mounted a multinational operation using to the maximum extent the difference of errors of the different nations present there uh, to making sure that we could have this crowd control being totally successful without having to use lethal forces. For us French, we cannot use APC nor armor against a crowd. 
For the Brits, they cannot use combat gas or tear gas against a crowd. Dans can use their APC against a crowd. And us French, with our French gendarme, we can use tear gas. So what we did is uh, four nations multinational operation using all the capabilities and caveats of all the nation to sort out the operational problem. So in Danish APCs, we have put British crews who can fire uh, rubber bullets and use their dogs, but we can't do, no, no, nobody could apart from them. We French gendarme preparing uh, the field for that, uh, launching grenades with tear gas. And then the Danish APCs charge of the crowd, the doors open, and the British crew got out of there and were able to have a maximum effect. So, a tactical level, this difference is used to its maximum extent possible, uh, extent possible because all difficulties have been leveled at operational level. So you can see when you speak about strategic, operational, and tactical, you have different views about the efficiency of multinational team. However, uh, this example I just gave you is one of the examples based on NATO nations who've been training together and who have converging cultures and values. Uh, where it becomes to be a problem, and that's really a problem of interoperability, is when you come in a coalition with partners who have totally different views on the world and where the cultural differences are beginning to be a, a real problem. And I think nowadays we see some issues in Iraq, for instance, in the fight against ISIL, about some ethical problems we do have, should we support or not troops when they don't behave? And uh, those are limits of coalition. And when we think about interoperability, we have to think about hardware, of course. Uh, it's important to making sure that the electrons can talk to each other and the, the, the C2 system understand each other. We must be making sure as well that our soldiers or at least commanders can understand each other with a common language. But I think where the huge bridge or huge gap has to be bridged in multinationality is regarding laws, culture and ethical approach to warfare. I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kayanuma from Japan, Self Defense Force. And the, uh, I have, I, I'm an infantry, and the, uh, my uh, experience of the multinational operation it was the, I participated to the uh, UNDOF, which is uh, deployed in the uh, Golan Heights, which is uh, between the, uh, Israel, Israel and uh, Syria. So I was in charge of the uh, Japanese contingent commander under the uh, Indian general and uh, I have uh, many good experience there. UNDOF is a very uh, unique mission uh, because uh, it's the second oldest mission uh, in the United Nations and uh, its mandate is uh, this engagement of uh, Israel and Syria. So uh, the one of the uh, very unique characteristic is the, uh, we have to understand the uh, two countries culture and uh, some regional issues. Of course the uh, Israel have a Jewish country and uh, Syria is a, a Muslim country. So uh, our task is uh, transportation so Every day we have to cross a border and uh, we have to communicate to the each soldiers every day. So uh, uh, it's sometimes it's very sensitive uh, to choose uh, what topic we talk and uh, of course there are some you know when we entered the Syrian territory from uh, Israel, we have to check every uh, thing in, in our vehicle, uh, which is not uh, contained some related to the Israel, Israel or some heavy use things. So uh, that's a very in interesting. So uh, it's a very, uh, 
sometimes it's so difficult to educate to our soldiers so uh, difference between the uh, Israel and the Syria but uh, uh, advantage for Japanese army is uh, uh, excuse me Japanese ground self-defense force is uh, we don't have uh, some specific problem with the uh, Jewish and the uh, Muslims because uh, Japanese have uh, Shinto or Buddhism religion so uh, that's a kind of advantage of the uh, conduct this kind of the uh, mission Indian troops have uh, many experience of uh, actually a uh, live war or conflict because uh, most of soldiers have experience working in the uh, border area between the Pakistan or Kashmir region and uh, on the other hand the you know, Japanese soldiers doesn't have such kind of experience so uh, at the time you know the uh, Golan Heights I was deployed that area in uh, 2012 so at the time already the uh, many levels uh, infiltrate in our AO area operation uh, so uh, sometimes we experienced a very difficult situation to deal with the uh, uh, that kind of rebels or Syrian army uh, who deployed inside our AO uh, so uh, most of uh, in most uh, of the situation the uh, Indian general his decision is kind of a uh, very aggressive uh, one morning one morning the uh, Syrian army uh, conducted the uh, artillery strike on the rebels stronghold and it's very close to our MSL and they, uh, I got a phone from my uh, force commander he ordered me to uh, come uh, Syrian side uh, to meet the, some uh, Syrian army's officer colonel or somebody else and have a uh, luncheon but uh, I already observed the many you know the motor or artillery impact are on the MSL so uh, I told the uh, general sir I cannot go because you know the many motor impact very close to the, our MSL to the to your camp so uh, he, the general, general said okay I will send the, my uh, armor vehicle so you can get on it and come immediately uh, so I asked the uh, commander again the, sorry sir so this is not acceptable for you know our, from our standards you know it, uh, actually the, now it's a uh, motor impacting so this is so difficult so this kind of uh, things is uh, happen uh, continuously but uh, finally the, uh, uh, the general can could understand the uh, what uh, our standards or what the criteria of making a decision so uh, yeah of course uh, before I re we reach the agreement I try to explain uh, to the general that what is our constitution like and the, uh, what our background or what our capability or something so uh, I thought that this is kind of the uh, you know uh, attempt to explain explanation is uh, so important to reach the uh, agreement or make us understand the what you know uh, each army strike. Our constitution is a bit unique, so uh, the constitution is. Uh, constitution prohibit to use our weapon to uh, offensive nature so only use the defensive nature and uh, moreover we cannot use our weapon uh, to protect 
other countries' soldiers. We can use our weapon only for ourselves. The Australian United States military experience goes back to the First World War. On the Western Front in July 1918, the Australians needed to conduct a preliminary operation prior to the final Amiens offensive into Germany. This included a divisional attack on the town of La Hamel. It's become known as the Battle of Hamel. The 4th Australian Division was somewhat depleted at this point and the commanding general, General Monash, needed reinforcements. He looked to his US counterpart, 15th Brigade, to provide those reinforcements. Through rapport and trust, he was able to bring together the Australian, New Zealand and US reinforcements into a single battle against the town of Hamel. This was highly successful and ensured operations more broadly across the Allied front were able to commence as planned. It also was renowned for its combining of arms of infantry, armour, artillery and aviation. And importantly, it started a long and enduring relationship between the countries of Australia, New Zealand and the United States. Hopefully these insights will assist you in your continued studies of multinational operations.